They're odd. They're absurd. And some of them are just downright crazy. But car companies do this and they all try it. Some of the biggest car companies out there have built themselves off of some of these great products. But some of these oddities have just been lost in time. They're weird. They're out there. They're crazy. Hell, some of them are even ahead of their time. But oddities exist. And every major automobile manufacturer out there has one. At least one. But why do they do it? Well, market share is always it. Being the first to enter a specific market and being the first to basically create and carve out that little bit of a niche to build yourself as something amazing. Automotive oddities. They're amazing little products, sometimes ahead of their time and sometimes just downright odd. Today, we're going to be talking about the automotive oddities that car companies have brought us. Welcome back to the Auto Looks Podcast. I'm your host, as always, the doctor to the automotive industry, Mr. Everett J, coming to you from our main host website at autolooks.net. If you haven't been there, stop by, check it out, read some of the reviews, check out some of the ratings, go to the Corporate Links website page, big or small, we have them all on the Corporate Links website page. We have links to all your major automotive companies that we talk about in each one of our podcasts, all from the autolooks.net website. The Autolux Podcast is brought to you by Ecom Entertainment Group and distributed by podbeam.com if you'd like to get in touch with us track us down on any major social site streaming service or through email at email at autolux.net so like i said in the beginning i am your host everett j and i'm bringing you the automotive oddities They've existed since the beginning of time, and in the early days of the automobile industry, oddities were everywhere, everybody trying everything, from uses of different types of fuel. Like, steam-powered vehicles were a thing in the past. Electric vehicles were there at the beginning. Then we have gasoline, we have diesel, we have kerosene. Everybody was trying everything in the automobile world. Now, these may have been just different types of fuel sources, but some of them were a little bit odd. And we look back at it, and we don't remember a lot of these. How many people today living can tell me about one single manufacturer that built a steam-powered vehicle? Hell, a car show years ago. I got to witness one in operation. Steam power was there, and it was one of the original oddities. Well, everybody was going after either electric or gasoline. A few in the industry said, let's try and make cars run by steam. They never really carved out their niche, but they were there, and it was an oddity at the beginning. Throughout time, we've added some new ones into it. Chrysler being one of those early pioneers in the automotive industry, trying to break through the mold and prove to the world that it was different than both Ford and General Motors. They needed to find new niches. And being one of those smaller car companies, even into the 90s, they always needed to be one step ahead of the competition. And they always have. And back in the 1930s, they were one of the first car companies to look at aerodynamics to try and bring down fuel economy. Now, this was at a time where people weren't thinking about a fuel economy all the way up until the time of World War II. Nobody really considered it. Fuel was abundant in everywhere. But when rations started kicking in during World War II, Chrysler took a look at it and said, maybe we could find a way to try and bring down our fuel consumption in our vehicles. And they created the Chrysler Airflow, designed around trains and the aerodynamics that they were utilizing at that point in time. The airflow broke down the barrier for the future. It brought us into the design era of the 1940s and soon into the 50s, all in the 30s, giving us aerodynamics and showing that we can reduce our fuel consumption on vehicles through a more streamlined design. Today, it's one of those weird oddities that when you see it in an auto show, you think it's something from like the late 40s or into the 50s. But seeing that it came out in the 1930s and it was a pioneer for automotive design makes you wonder. Kind of like BMW and one of their original starts, the Isetta or even the BMW 600, a small micro car coming from a car company that builds luxury cars. Today, we look back back at the Isetta and ask ourselves, why would they have built something like this? Well, Germany was just coming out of World War II and starting to grow again. Well, West Germany. And they needed vehicles for people. Well, didn't matter what you were building. People were going to buy it. BMW saw a market and a way to get in. And they used the Isetta to push themselves into the future. Similar to that of Hyundai using the Pony, selling an abundance of them and utilizing that money to help build their vehicles for the future. The Isetta did. 
did that. So first we have one, an oddity that helped reduce our fuel consumption. Then we had one that broke through. But there are a multitude of different reasons that car companies create weird oddities. If you've watched the Oscar winning movie Ford versus Ferrari, you understand the GT40. An original project that was essentially spearheaded by Carroll Shelby himself with Ken Miles and Carroll Shelby being brought over by Ford and being taken away from a project he was working on with De Tommaso at the time, the GT40 was built to go up against Ferrari at Le Mans and beat them. Sole single purpose of that oddity. When you look at it compared to anything else in the Ford lineup in the 60s, it does not fit that genre. Every single design does not look like anything like the GT. Of course, the GT was designed and essentially originally built in Europe and brought over for final completion in America to give it that American grunt. But it was more of a European design and it was really showcased to this. And the Europeans were really good at doing supercars compared to anyone else. So why not use the best of both worlds to help you move to the forefront of the future? Now, really, since then, Ford has never really built any other supercars until they literally built the GTs in the early 2000s, and then again with the last GT models. Besides that, Ford's been Mustangs and Thunderbirds, and that's it. No supercars. But that one oddity built for Le Mans held its title. And although very expensive and very rare, even in its new variations, the GT is an amazing product. Similar to that of how Cosworth helped Ford build the super van. Who wants to make a van go super fast? Well, apparently Ford did in Europe. This was a major oddity because people never even thought of a van of something going fast. It was never put into production, but spanning three different variations, one in the 70s, one in the 80s, and one just a few years ago with the electric, Ford has gone through and built a multitude of the super vans to prove that you can make a van go fast. Even though this oddity has never made it into production form, it is showcased to us that vans can be fun, fast, and even cool, helping develop the aftermarket van industry. And being in 1971, it was at the forefront of the aftermarket van world. Sure, a lot of the vans we built back in the 70s weren't the super fast ones as the super van, but they were amazingly cool products, and it showcased to the world that you can make a van cool by aftermarket modification. So it helped pioneer the aftermarket van industry. Now, Ferrari may not be a company that comes to mind when you think of weird oddities, but they've actually had a few throughout their history, all of them being small coach build variations of pre-existing vehicles, kind of like the 365 shooting brake, the 365 beach car, and hell, even the 456 GT Venice wagon and the 456 Saloon Pinfredis from the 90s, v built in very small numbers off of existing production vehicles. These were built for select markets. Hell, Bentley has done this too by building the Dominator SUV for rich sheiks in the Middle East. There's not a lot of them out there and even today they still do that. Similar to Aston Martin building the Lagonda and the Lagonda Tarif models. These are select models built for select few. Limited production run vehicles. that are the oddities in the production lineups. Ferrari would never think of building a beach vehicle vehicle or a shooting brake or even a sedan or station wagon. It doesn't fall in their product lineup, but along with coach building companies like Pinferini and design houses, they could build them for select customers. These oddities only exist because there are customers out there looking for them and wanting them. Ferrari has kind of gotten into this, same with Lamborghini and even McLaren building specialized vehicles for select customers. And the beach car, the shooting brake, and the saloon are all examples of that. Aston Martin's, on the other hand, the Lagonda, Lagonda Tarif of a few years back, well, Aston Martin and Lagonda were always together, joined at the hip. Lagonda was more of the standardized luxury products, where Aston Martin was more of the sports car grand touring products. But Aston Martin getting into bed and using the Lagonda name to build a sedan, hell, they did it again in the late 2000s, early 2010s with the Rapide. But why would they do that? Why do they want a sedan? Well, 
Porsche did that. Porsche opened up the market for sports car manufacturers to get into more mainstream products. The Cayenne opened the floodgates to the world of mainstream. Now, it has actually brought down the image of Porsche automobiles as now Porsche is deemed more of a luxury manufacturer and not a dedicated sports car manufacturer. And see, that's why Ferrari doesn't get into doing products like that. The Pearsec is one of the few products that Ferrari has actually pushed out there only because it's a rise in their GT division. Or if you've listened to our previous podcast about the evolution of Ferrari GTs, you'll understand that Grand Touring products from Ferrari, so four seater vehicles have essentially just evolved into the pure saying the pure saying is essentially an evolution of the ff the ff being another oddity because it's an original shooting brake 365 daytona of the 1970s was a shooting brake built for select customers where the ff was actually a production vehicle ferrari never wanted to move into full mainstream like porsche did with the panamera and cayenne but they wanted a little bit more mainstream sales to get them more money so they could build the supercars that they really want like the la ferrari and to do that you have to make money so products like the ff the piercing are there to build your product lineup similar to that of lamborghini bringing out the urs now Going a little more mainstream to prop up your bottom end so you can get more money at the top end. But not everybody gets into these weird oddities like that. Koenigsegg refuses to get into the sedan or SUV marketplace, but will still do a GT product with the Camara. The funny thing is, is when they got into the GT product, they essentially built a sedan with only two doors. And how do you do that? You create a going door that opens to a point you can access a front end and rear seat. It still qualifies as a grand touring product, but all four seats are easily accessible like a sedan. The Camara is one of those weird oddities. It's built for a select part of the marketplace, and a lot of car companies have done that. They've carved out their own little niche to try and break their way through. Some companies have tried to jump in and carve out a new niche in a marketplace and been successful with it. Some of them have taken a while to be successful at it, and some of them have fallen flat on their face. The Pontiac Aztec is one of those products which is a weird oddity that everybody wants to forget. A horribly ugly design, but perfect product planning. It was an original trekking model at the very forefront of the revival of the trekking industry. And the Aztec was built to do what it needs to do. It needed to go into the backwoods. It needed the ability for you to be able to sleep inside. It needed the ability to be easily cleaned. Its only problem is that its design was horrible. Honda built a similar product to the Aztec, a very odd oddity, the Honda Element. But its design, even though a giant toaster on wheels, was still better looking than the Aztec. The Aztec, if it had had a Pontiac Vibe front end on it, would have done a lot better in the marketplace. But even still, it was ahead of its time. Where vehicles like this, we are starting to see today. We're starting to see a lot more trekking models and a lot more versatility in our product ranges. Hence the active lifestyle vehicle marketplace. It was an oddity that helped build a new age product lineup. Unfortunately, it came out too early and it was from a car company that no longer exists. But it makes you ask yourself, why doesn't Buick bring back its variation? Yeah, Buick had a variation of the Aztec. The Rendezvous wasn't as versatile, but it was a little bit better looking. But Pontiac did that to try and carve out their niche in a new marketplace. Chrysler did that with the minivan back in the 19th. 80s that it was retro inspiration vehicles like the Plymouth Prowler and PT Cruiser in the 2000s. These are retro inspired vehicles carving out a niche when people were looking for that baby boomer original style vehicles. They wanted something cool, something new, and they created these oddities that people would want. You know, some oddities are great oddities and completely get swept under the rug. The original Honda Odyssey was not essentially a minivan per say because it did not have sliding doors it was more of a crossover with four hinge doors in a minivan package this helped pave the way for products like the chrysler pacifica and even later on the ford fusion mondeos even the mazda 5s they helped create the crossover marketplace you don't think the odyssey at its very beginning would have been a crossover everybody remembers the second generation honda odysseys that squared off 
weird box one that a lot of people have turned into aftermarket tuner vehicles, but the original Odyssey had four hinge doors and was the pioneer of the crossover marketplace, similar to that of how the Caravan was the pioneer of the minivan marketplace. There were the oddities in the market. And like we said, not all oddities get remembered. Hell, the BMW Z1 was an oddity in the Roadster market with sliding doors. The Chrysler TC was both a collaboration of Chrysler and Maserati to build a luxury Grand Tour for the American marketplace, which never took off. Similar to that of the Cadillac Elante, the Toyota Serra, similar to the Auto Zom, AZ1, were sports cars by manufacturers you would never think build amazing products like that. But some oddities come into the marketplace to save car companies. When fuel mileage came into play after the global economic crisis of 2008, some companies needed to find a way to bring down their average mile per gallon for the entire lineup. Aston Martin did this by teaming up a Toyota to build the Aston Martin Signet. Now, they built thousands upon thousands of these products and only sold a few thousand of them. But they were built to bring down their miles per gallon. But other companies have done that in the past. The Dodge Daytona Superbird, the Lancia Stratos, the Audi Sport Quattro, the Ford Cobra Jet are all products built for racing homogenization. They needed products sold to the marketplace so that they could build and have these amazing products in racing. How we talked about in our unicorns, the Ford RS, built for the rally circuit similar to that of the Audi Sport Quattro and the Lancia Stratos, this was a product only built to serve one purpose. It was a racing car that had to be sold for the street. And that's where some of these oddities come from. Now, the Sport Quattro helped push Audi to the forefront of automobile technology, with the Quattro powertrain being utilized within their marketplace now. So same with the Ford RS. Now the Dodge Daytona Superbird helped push the Hemi to even faster ratings. But the Lancia Stratos is one of those weird oddities. When you look at Lancia across the board, all of their vehicles fall into a standardized premium marketplace, bland, boring. And then you get the Strato just sitting there as this amazingly fun car, similar to the, the Honda NSX and even the Lexus LFA. They're odd cars to be seen in those specific lineups. You're used to bland, boring cars and all of a sudden, bam, there's this one amazing product. 1992 Jaguar XJ220. A car built to take over the fastest land speed record for a production car was released by Jaguar of the XJs. They built luxury sedans and GT cars. They didn't build supercars, just like Lancia didn't build rally racing sports cars. And Lexus doesn't build a supercar. These oddities came out of nowhere. Jaguar built theirs to go racing and to beat a land speed record. Lancia built theirs to go racing in. But the Lexus LFA only came to be through development of technology that was no longer going to be used. The V10 and Lexus LFA was built for one sole purpose, to go racing. It was built for Formula One. But when Formula one decided to downgrade their motors to the V8s, this V10 and all of its development technology behind it and all of the money that Toyota Motor Corporation poured into this needed to find a home. You're not just going to build a motor and walk away from it, are you? No. Toyota's like, no, we got to make some money off of this thing. So last minute ditch, they decided to utilize this engine that they had built. They're not going to go Formula One racing with it because they can't utilize it anymore. They're going to put it in a limited production supercar and sell it under the Lexus name plate. Help push Lexus into more global marketplaces with a supercar with its name on it. Sort of similar to how Acura managed to push the NSX and the Acura nameplate even further out in the North American marketplaces. Hell, they even pushed it into Middle Eastern marketplaces, all thanks to the NSX, which was a Honda everywhere else. But the LFA? That's just Lexus. It's an oddity in its marketplace. Lexus had the SCs from before, these convertible coupes. And here's the LFA, this amazing supercar. Similar to Lamborghini releasing the LM002. Originally built from the Cheetah concept, the Lamborghini was building to go after a military contract with the Italian military. They did this for two reasons. The military came to them and asked them, because they had production, if they were willing to look at building a military spec vehicle. Lamborghini agreed, and he wanted to build out his manufacturing facilities. He wanted to make more money off of his products. When a military contract, you're set for 
a few years, you can use that money to help build up your supercar and even tractor manufacturing at that point in time. But when they decided to pull away and not utilize the Lamborghini, again, like what happened decades later with the LFA, they're stuck with a product that they completely finished, ready to go, they didn't win the contract. So, Lamborghini released it as the fastest accelerating pickup truck in the world. A truck with a box that's barely usable. But they knew they could find a market for this thing. They knew there were a lot of rich sheiks in the Middle East that would want one of the fastest desert run trucks ever. That's what the, the original Cheetah was built for. So Lamborghini and Lexus were both just making money off of the products they built that the contracts they didn't win. But not every great oddity is built to go after a niche or carve out a new niche or bring more awareness. Some of them are just literally thrown out to the wind just to see if people are going to bite on it. And there's been a few even in just the past few years. The Ford Explore Sport Track, the Accord Cross Tour Ridgeline, Land Rover Evoc, and Nissan Murano Cross Cabriolet are all products kind of just thrown out to the wind to see if people would bite on them. The Sport Track was Ford's first attempt to build a unibody pickup truck, similar to that of how the Ridgeline came about a few years later. They wanted to go after a new marketplace and see if they could put a pickup truck bed on an SUV. They wanted to see if crossover utility vehicles could be utilized for intercity pickup travel. Well, nobody really bid on the Ford Explorer Sport Track, but the Honda Ridgeline, more people were starting to bite on because of its versatility. People saw it more as a SUV with a box in it than a pickup truck and honda is one of those companies that'll hold on to something as long as they're making some sort of profit off of it similar to that of the element vehicles you didn't think were selling but were selling enough of for them to hold on to it they know the market was there the cross tour and original zdx the market wasn't there yet it was there in the luxury marketplace for the bmw x6 and eventually the cla but unfortunately for honda and acura both in the standard and and premium marketplace, the active lifestyle vehicle marketplace wasn't there 15 years ago. It is there now, but they were just ahead of their time. Land Rover attempted to do this with the Evo, originally releasing it as a three-door coupe profile vehicle for the Land Rover marketplace, utilizing Victoria Beckham and her husband celebrity status to promote their product. They helped build more momentum behind it. Now, the Evo didn't blow up upon the world, but adding two more doors and getting in a fight with a Chinese copycat helped put the Evoque at the forefront of the coupe SUV marketplace. Today, Land Rover owns that entire marketplace with the Evoque with no competition in sight and only Jeep now getting into it with the new Wagoneer S. They carved out a niche. Nissan tried to do this with the Murano Cross Cabriolet to give us a convertible CUV mark. Land Rover did this with the Evoque convertible and Volkswagen did it with the T-Roc convertible. A multitude of different companies have tried the oddity of creating a convertible crossover utility vehicle. The unfortunate thing for those oddities is the market for convertibles is so small these days that no product can really break that marketplace except for luxury coupes. If the convertible marketplace rebounded, then maybe CUV convertibles might become a bigger thing. But I don't know about you. Everybody thinks the concept of a convertible Murano or Evoque or T-Roc is in the same context of a Wrangler, but it's not because the Wrangler is built in that context because that's the original way it was set out into the world. It was for easy egress and ingress. They needed it so military could jump in and out of it. So it built its profile off of that originally. These vehicles didn't and people don't see these vehicles as that marketplace. So in a sense, a convertible Evo, Cross Cabriolet, Murano, or even the T-Rock convertible are just oddities in a marketplace that attempted to try for it but just couldn't make it there oddities. There's been a lot over the automotive history, all starting from finding new ways to develop products and finding new niches. We did an entire podcast about Chrysler's new niche marketplace going into the hybrid aftermarket marketplace with the Pacifica S Hybrid, carving out a new niche similar to they did when the original Caravan came out. Oddities are here for select purposes. They're a way for car companies to get their money back. They're a way to meet specifications for racing 
learning circuits. It's a way to showcase new technology or a possible way to carve out a new niche into a pre-existing marketplace. Automotive oddities are here and there's going to be more in the future. The amazing thing about them is oddities are those vehicles that people don't remember and some of them were some great products and some of them, well, let's just say there's a reason they were forgotten. So if you like this podcast, please like, share, or comment about it on any major social feed, streaming service, or on the autolux.net website. Send us an email over at email at autolux.net. And after that, share this podcast with your friends, family, hell, your coworkers, and your boss. Send it out to everybody and tell them about all the oddities out in the world. And have they owned any of these oddities? We all like to hear from our listeners about all the oddities that they know of, have seen, driven, or been a part of back in history. History. We've heard about some great ones from some of our listeners over the years, and trust me, there are some great stories out there just waiting to be heard all about the amazing, odd products that car companies have built and created. And after that, stop by the website, read some of the reviews, check out some of the ratings, go to the Corporate Links website page and find all the automotive companies that we have talked about in this podcast. Big or small, we have them all on the Autolux.net website. The Autolux Podcast is brought to you by Ecom Entertainment Group and distributed by Podbeam.com. If you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email over at email at Autolux.net. So for myself, Everett J, the Autolux team here, strap yourself in for this one fun wild ride that the world of automotive oddities will take us on.